بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشيء in the last session, we talked about understanding the Qur'an. And we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Qur'an so that it can be understood. And especially, He has made it easy to be understood and to be remembered. And we mentioned some of the verses of the Qur'an. But this doesn't mean that we don't need preparation or that everyone can understand the same level of the depths of the meanings of the Quran. So the Quran is made easy and understandable, but we need also to prepare ourselves. There are some aspects of the Quran that everyone with some little knowledge can understand if you know the language or you if you have a good translation you can still benefit from the Quran without any prior knowledge but if you want to really get the message of the Quran if you want the Quran to become your guide you need to be familiar with the entire Quran because for example maybe you are reading Today, this chapter or this page of the Qur'an, but the Qur'an has your solution in another chapter. Or maybe in many cases, you have to put several things together so that we come up with the answer. So if someone is not familiar with the entire Qur'an, then it would be not necessarily able to get the answer. Otherwise, the answer is definitely there as we quoted the hadith from Imam Sadiq in one of the early sessions that there is no two people who disagree on something unless there is a principle in the Quran. If they refer to that principle, they can solve the problem. But Imam said, وَلَكَنْ لَا تَبْلُغُهُ أَقُولُ الرَّجَالِ But the people, normal people cannot understand by the reason. It needs to be familiar with the Quran and also you need to have taqwa. Because Quran says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا للمتقين. This is the guidance. Everyone can come and benefit, but everyone should qualify himself or herself. In addition to knowledge, there is need for taqwa. If there is no taqwa, then the Quran may not make sense to you. The Quran may not disclose its beauty and its you know wonders to you as inshallah we will talk uh, maybe monday uh, about this issue that how the quran starts speaking to you so knowledge is required taqwa is required and here i mean by taqwa at least to be honest and truthful maybe the person is not yet a muslim but if there is sincerity and honesty, this is the you know, amount of taqwa that even such people should have so that they can got, get the guidance from the Qur'an. If you remember in the course about indicators of piety, we mentioned how important it is to be truthful and committed to the truth. So, a person like Abu Dhar, like Salman, and many people like them, or people today who are truthful, even if they are not a believer in God, if they are truthful and they really seek the truth, then they can benefit from the Qur'an. You don't need to be a full practicing Muslim to understand the Qur'an or appreciate the Qur'an. You have to be truthful. And of course, when you discover the Qur'an, then you follow it. But to begin with... You don't need to be practicing. You need just to be pure in your heart. You need to be a person who doesn't want to 
deny or disregard the truth. Then we have different layers of the meaning of the Quran. We said that yesterday in the hadith from the Prophet that the Quran has out, an outward uh, aspect, external aspect, and an inward or internal aspect. To be able to go to the deeper levels of the meaning of the Quran, we need to do tafsir. And tafsir means to unveil. In Arabic language, originally tafsir means kashful gana. When a lady, for example, has a burqa, or has a whale, and then the veil is removed, this is called tafsir. It means it's disclosed, it's unveiled. So there are some layers of the meaning of the Quran which are hidden. On top of it is the literal meaning. You have to be able to go deeper so that you reach those layers. And that is the job of Mufassir, the one who interprets the Quran. But something very important is that there must be, this is absolutely important because unfortunately we face many people who do tafsir and they are not doing it properly. They mention their own opinions and then they say this is tafsir. And you know sometimes for example there is no relevance at all. A proper tafsir is the one which starts with the literal meaning and then tries to go deeper. Not that you completely ignore the literal meaning and say this is the tafsir. For example, if for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Maqam Ibrahim and Kaaba, then you say this means human soul and human, I don't know, body. And How did you come to that? You have to show that this is in compliance with the literal meaning, with the outward meaning, with the external aspect of the Quran. When you are going to dive into an ocean, you have to go first and touch the surface and then go down. And also when you come back again, you have to go out from the surface. A Mufassir is the one who dives who, or delves into the ocean. So first, you must approach the surface, the literal meaning. Then you go deep and then you come back again from the surface. What does it mean? It means that you have to show what is the connection between the meaning that you say and the letters of the Qur'an, the words which are spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot just say something, you know, which is baseless. So every person who gives you a tafsir of a verse which is not first in compliance with the literal meaning, and second, he is not able to show that it is based on that, you should not accept First, must be in compliance. It means that it must not be against it. Second, it must be understandable. It must be something which can be shown to relate. Because sometimes people say something and it can be true. It's not against the t text. It's not in conflict. But there is no proof that it is related. Because there are things that may be true. They don't conflict. But still, it's not the meaning. So, for example, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Zalik al-kitab la rayba fi. And I say, kitab means, for example, my a spiritual master. And then you ask me, how? I say, this is button. You have to be very close to Allah to understand these things. <laughs> Don't question me. Okay, this doesn't make sense. How did you 
realize that Ketam means your peer or your you know, Murshid or your instructor. How did you understand? And how did you understand that Lairai Bafi means that you shouldn't question your spiritual mentor? Whatever he says, you have to accept. So people, you know, sometimes make these kind of tafsirs and indeed we have volumes of tafsir like this. But some well-known scholars, they do volumes of tafsir like this and it's all their own understanding, you know. It's good as a poem. This is a, you know, as a poetic you know, piece of work, it's good. You read, you, maybe you enjoy it. But it's not tafsir of the Qur'an. Tafsir must be very much dependent on the text of the Qur'an with proper methodology. And a proper methodology is the one that makes it available for others to comment. You know, if I have a proper methodology, so you can also check. Say, okay, I went and observe the same methodology and I don't agree with you. But when I am not ready to give you any clue about the way I have come to this conclusion, so there is no assessment, there is no possibility of collective evaluation. And this is not scientific. Any scientific work must be made in the way that other people can look at the process and say, yes, this process doesn't lead to that or leads to that. So, a sound tafsir is the one that is completely loyal to the literal meaning. Of course, sometimes we know for sure that the literal meaning must be interpreted in the way which is not exactly as it is said literally. But this has its own method. For example, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yadullah fawqa aidihim, hand of God is above their hands. Okay, we know that Allah doesn't have hand. And because Allah knows that we know that He has no hand, He has spoken in this way. This is something that every rational person understands. When Allah doesn't have hand, it means that the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very common in language when we say hand means power. Or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ja'a rabbuka wal malaku saffan saffa, your Lord and angels came. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't go from one place to another place. When we say Allah came, it means that His command came. His affair has happened. So these are the things which are obvious. And every rational person you can discuss with him and he says, okay, I understand this. Or even he may say, okay, I don't agree with you. He brings his arguments, we can discuss. But if someone says, this is something which I find in my heart, I cannot explain to you. You cannot ask me. Okay. In the best scenario, this may be good for you. I cannot take it from you. I cannot accept this from you. This is not the way science can improve. The first person who was Mufassir of the Qur'an, who was there to explain the Qur'an, was the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Qur'an says that the Prophet, in addition to reciting the Qur'anic verses, had the job of teaching the Qur'an. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحَبِّ If the Prophet was just reading the Qur'an, so what is the meaning of تَعْلِيمُ الْكِتَابِ Because it says, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He was reciting to them the divine communications verses and purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom. So we realize that teaching the book is different from just reading the Qur'an. So the Prophet first of all was telling people that this chapter for example has been revealed to me. And also he was teaching them. So if they had any questions, anything that they didn't realize about the words, about the whole sentence, about the whole chapter, they asked the Prophet. And the Prophet explained to them. Or if he himself felt that something is necessary to be explained, he explained that. And we have 
many hadith from the Prophet in which the Prophet comments on the verses of the Quran and interprets the verses of the Quran. So, uh, this is the first Mufassar of the Quran. We don't know how many times the Prophet did this and how many verses have been commented by the Prophet, but at least today we have substantial amount of hadith from the Prophet about tafsir. And for example, Suyuti, Jalaluddin Abdurrahman Suyuti, he has compiled the whole uh, hadith of the Prophet according to chapters of the Quran, chapter by chapter. If he has received or been able to find any hadith, he has put them in the order according to the chapters, and these are now published. I give you one example. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about fasting that eat and drink hatta yatabayyan al khaytul abyaz min al khaytul aswad till the white thread becomes distinguishable from the black thread. So what is white thread and black thread? Does it mean that we have to bring two threads and you know, compare this? We can realize which one is black and white and this is the time that we should stop eating. The Prophet ﷺ commented that in this way, that it is the darkness of the night and the whiteness of the day. So black means night and white is the day. So when this become clear is the time of Fajr. The Prophet explained that this means that you can eat and drink before Fajr. When Fajr comes, then you cannot. So, interpretations like this are given by the Prophet, and they are some, some of them are available and even actually compiled uh, by some people. Then, after the Prophet wasallam, still the Quran is in need of a teacher. The Prophet himself said, I need, I, I'm, uh, I need to leave you. Allah has called me. I leave among you two weighty things. One is the book of Allah. One is my household. And you have to grasp both of them. They will never separate. And as long as you grasp both of them and hold on to both of them, you will not go astray. So the task of explaining the Qur'an and teaching the Qur'an was handed over to the Ahlul Bayt salam. Imam Ali salam continued the job of the Prophet in teaching the Qur'an. And therefore you find that even those who are not followers of Imam Ali salam, when it comes to the knowledge of the Qur'an, in a way or another, they go back to him. Because the most important Mufassar of the Qur'an outside Ahlul Bayt is Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas was a student of Imam. Not only was cousin of Imam, was a student of Imam. And he was, you know, very young at the uh, time of the Prophet. So he received his knowledge from Imam Ali and he was a master and then he had his student for example like Mujahid if you refer to many tafsirs of our Sunni brothers they quote from Mujahid and Mujahid was a student of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Abbas was a student of Imam Ali or when it comes to the Quranic recit recitation so the most uh, reliable is Hafs from Asim, and Asim was from Kufa, and he learned from Imam Ali. So, there are some books that if you like, you can, you know, read about this. For example, there is a book, Ta'asis al Shia Al-Ulum Al-Islam. It's about the role of Shia in founding Islamic sciences. So, it shows how in tafsir, in recitation, in Arabic uh, grammar, how uh, Imam Ali and his followers were pioneers. So, 
the job of the teaching of the Quran was continued by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam The hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam about tafsir are alhamdulillah available in some of the books. Unfortunately, we don't have all of them, but in some of the books we have them. For example, we have Tafsir Nur al This Tafsir is based on the Hadith. So, about every verse that he has received or has been able to find Hadith, he mentions the Hadith in the bottom of the verse and explains. Or we have, for example, Tafsir al-Burhan, which is also based on Hadith. Or before we have Tafsir Ali ibn Ibrahim, Tafsir al-Furat al-Kufi, Tafsir of Imam Askari. These are all tafsir based on the hadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. When it comes to the Sunni Islam, so they have either from the Prophet, unfortunately not that much, directly from Ahlul Bayt. Uh, Sometimes there are, but not. But for example, a lot from Ibn Abbas. And recently, uh, two volumes have been published in Beirut, called Tanvir al miqbas fi Tafsir ibn Abbas. So this two volume has put together all the commentaries of ibn Abbas on the Quran. Then we have different methods of Tafsir. So in that paper I have mentioned that for example we have interpretation of the Quran based on the Hadith. We have interpretation of the Quran based on mysticism, a kind of mystical interpretation of the Quran. We have scientific interpretation of the Quran. There are people, especially in the last century, who are very uh, interested in science. They were trying to relate things to physics, chemistry, you know, uh, all these kind of things, biology. And sometimes they became, I think, um, too much maybe, uh, you know, interested in science in the sense that they wanted to justify everything scientifically even for the miracles sometimes they tried to find a scientific explanation they thought that everything must be explained according to the laws of the nature and they didn't realize that we have supernatural also laws and there are also uh, tafsirs which are mostly focused on the Arabic language explanation of the words and the gra grammar but the best method of tafsir which alhamdulillah have always been there but especially has been revived by uh, the late Allama Tabatabai is tafsir al-Qur'an bil Quran to interpret the Quran according to the Quran this is something which is very reliable because the Quran has come for our guidance and to be a guide the Quran has to be clear so you must be able to get the message of the Quran from the Quran itself Al-Quran yufassiru ba'dhu ba'dha part of Quran can interpret another part of the Quran the Quran says the verses of the Quran are two there are muhkamat and there are mutashabaha, those which are the main verses, which are very clear, and those which are mutashabahat, which can be interpreted in different ways. You have to refer mutashabaha to muhkamat and understand the meaning. And there are many discussions about this. This is the best method of tafsir to try to understand the Quran according to the Quran, of course, with good scholarly knowledge of the Arabic and uh, the science of Usul al-Fiqh which helps you to understand the text and more than anything else purity taqwa this taqwa is very important because if there is no taqwa so sometimes you think that uh, either consciously or unconsciously that this cannot be the message why? because it's going to affect your life if something doesn't suit me, either I uh, don't understand it at all, or if I understand, I, you know, 
interpret it another way. People, you know, depending on what suits them, can be very selective in their understanding. Sometimes they switch off their mind. They hear something, but they switch off their mind. Why? Because it doesn't suit them. They know that it has some implications for their life, so they don't want to understand. And sometimes they understand, but they pretend that they haven't understood. It is taqwa which is needed to open your heart and mind to the light of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, أَفَمَنْ شَرَحَ اللَّهُ الصَّدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ فَهُوَ عَلَى نُورًا مَنْ رَبَّهُ Is the one that Allah has opened up his breast for Islam, for submission. And therefore he has received light like someone whose heart is very hard. So he never remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are these two people the same? No. So what we need is to open up our mind and heart to the Quran so that the light of the Quran can reach us. If I say, no, I am fine, I don't need anything, I am just trying to read you, just I am respecting you, <laughs> but don't interfere with my understanding and with my life, therefore the Quran keeps silent, doesn't speak to us. Inshallah we will talk about this later when I talk about the Quran speaking to us. Okay. At the moment, <clears throat> because I don't want to discuss about different types of tafsir, I just wanted to uh, mention a little bit about what could be a proper method of tafsir, and especially I wanted to focus on understanding the Qur'an. According to the Qur'an, of course, with the help of the teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt as teachers of the Qur'an. The text is the Qur'an. We don't need any other text. You have one text, but you need teachers. Teachers don't bring any new text. They don't say, okay, there are some chapters that are not included there. We give you new chapters. No, everything we need is in the Quran. But we need teachers. We need people who are familiar with this and they can tell us how these chapters should be understood and applied to our life. So we are in need of teacher. And therefore, always when you understand the Quran, you must check it with the Hadith. Not that the Qur'an is unclear like what some akhbaris say. You know, akhbaris say we don't understand the Qur'an and the Qur'an is only for the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt. No, we say Qur'an is very clear, but we have to also check with the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and the Hadith because maybe we didn't get it right. You know, if we, I give you any book, even a book written by a human being, it's clear. But you always try to check with the people who have spent their life in learning that book. Forget even Ma'sumin. Even a person who is a scholar who has spent many years on this field, you try to see how he has understood this. So what about Ma'sumin alayhum salam who have been given this knowledge by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, no one can say, I don't need to go and read the hadith about the Quran. Quran is enough for me. Quran is sufficient for me. No, the Qur'an itself says that the Prophet was supposed to teach it. Or says that we have revealed the Qur'an to you, لَتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So that you explain to them. So we need someone to explain, but he explains, he doesn't add. He explains the Qur'an. So his role is to help us to understand the Qur'an in a proper way. Okay, now... I want to, inshallah, mention what should be our attitude toward the Qur'an. If you want to say, as a Muslim, what is my responsibility or what are my responsibilities towards the Qur'an? This is what we are going to talk in the, less, uh, in the next, inshallah, uh, two, ses two, three sessions. And inshallah we are going to talk about having faith in the Qur'an. We should have belief in the Qur'an or faith in the Qur'an. We should respect the Qur'an. We should read the Qur'an. We should look at the Qur'an. We should try to memorize the Qur'an as much as we can. We should try to reflect on the Qur'an. We should try to love the Qur'an, get familiar with the Qur'an. We should try to 
make Quran speak to us. So these are many things that, inshallah, if Allah helps, we are going to talk about it. So the very first thing is to believe in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Baqarah, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِي خُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This Qur'an, in which there is no doubt, is the guidance for the pious. Then he himself mentions who are the pious. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ One of the requirements for being Muttaqi, being pious, so that you receive guidance from Qur'an, is to believe in the Qur'an. يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ They believe in what has been revealed to you. If I say Qur'an is a nice text, Qur'an is a very good text to read, this is not enough. I say it's a very important text, one of the best, for example, sellers or one of the, you know, best books in the history of mankind, this is not enough. And still you can benefit from the Qur'an, but it's not enough. We need to believe in the Qur'an. We need to believe that this is word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has been sent to us for our guidance. And this belief has two levels. If I want to simplify, I say two levels at least. One is the belief that every Muslim has. Indeed, if someone says, I don't believe in the Qur'an as the revelation of God, he's not a Muslim. Even if he says, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, but he says, I don't believe in the Qur'an. So he has uh, disqualified his Islam, because he has rejected something that every person knows that this is a requirement of Islam. So, this is the first level, the first step, to believe in Qur'an. But this is not enough. To believe in the Qur'an means to act upon the Qur'an. To believe that you must follow the Qur'an. Because I, if I just say, I believe that Qur'an is revealed by God, but I don't believe that I should follow it. So this is not Iman. You have to follow it. Even if, na'uzu billah, I cannot, for example, practice some teachings of Qur'an. Okay, maybe I am late, too lazy, maybe, you know, I, I live in a situation that, you know, it's difficult for me, or anyway, if any thing is there that I cannot practice, I should say, I believe that what the Quran is right, but unfortunately, I am not able to do it. I am... For example, lazy or whatever. But it must be honest admission of my mistake, my shortcoming, my problem. So if I say no, Quran says this and I don't believe in that. This is na'uzu billah kufr. So if someone cannot, for example, get the courage to say his prayer always, or give homes or zakat or observe hijab or everything like that, at least must be fair enough to say, okay, I believe that I must do this. And I feel guilty, but I cannot do this. Maybe this person, inshallah, sometime will be able to find his way back. But if he says, Quran says hijab is necessary, but I don't believe. That is not for today. So this is kof. Sometimes it can be clear kof, sometimes it can be hidden kof, but it's not reliable, acceptable. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَا آمَنَ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنِ اسْتَحَلَّ مَحَارِمَهُ The one who takes the prohibited actions of Qur'an to be permissible, so he basically permits what Qur'an is prohibiting, has not faith in Qur'an, has not believed in the Qur'an. So to have faith in Qur'an is to follow the Qur'an. 
Not just to say, I love Quran, I, this is word of God. If you really believe that this is word of God, so you must follow it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in the Quran, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ Even the Prophet had iman, had faith in the Quran. Even the Prophet was fully following and observing the Quran. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ And the faithful also all believe in Allah and His books and messengers. So, the very first thing, which is of course very important, is to have a strong faith, strong belief in the Qur'an, and try to follow the Qur'an. The second thing is to look at the Qur'an. Looking at the Qur'an by itself is very important. One of the acts of worship is just to look at the Qur'an. And this is what everyone can do. Even a person who cannot read can look at the Qur'an. There is a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, "Anadaru fil mushaf min ghair qira'ah ibadatun." If you look at the Quran, even without reciting the Quran, without reading the Quran, it's ibadah. This is why I suggest for the people who read English translation to have a translation which comes with the Arabic text, so that while you are reading the translation, your eyes are also seeing the Qur'an. So you have benefit of looking at the Qur'an and also understanding the Qur'an. Imam Zainul Abidin is quoted as saying, Ayatul Qur'an khaza'in The verses of the Qur'an are treasures. فَكُلَّمَا فُتْحَتْ خِزَانُ When these treasures are opened, you should look at it. What is inside? If someone has a treasure and there are jewelries in that treasure when the door are open, so what do you do? You look at inside. Looking at the Quran is like looking at the treasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Quran comes from the treasure of Allah. You remember we talked about this ayah, إِنْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا إِنْدَنَا خَزَاءِنُهُ وَمَا نُنَزِّلُهُ إِلَّا بِقَدَرٍ مَعْلُونَ In Kanzul Ummal, which is a, a collection of hadith, which is very nice done by a Sunni scholar, he says that, quote from the Prophet, مَنْ أَدَى مَنْ نَظَرَ فِي الْمُصْحَفِ if someone keeps looking at the Quran, his vision, his eyesight would be protected as long as he lives in this dunya. So if you don't do anything wrong, you know, if you don't, you know, make yourself blind by something, this strengthens your eyes. So gives your eyes more power looking at the words of the Quran. There are even hadiths which says that even someone who has memorized the Quran and can read the Quran by heart, still it's better to look at the Quran and read from the text of the Quran. Although this person has memorized the Quran, but okay, your Eyes also have the right to look at the Qur'an. If you don't look at the Qur'an, you are depriving your eyes. For example, a person told Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, جُعِلْتُ فِدَاكِ إِنِّي أَحْفَظُ الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ ذَحْرَ قَلْبِي May I be your ransom. I know the Qur'an by heart. I can read it without reading the text. فَأَغْرَأُهُ عَلَىٰ ذَحْرِ قَلْبِي أَفْضَلْ أَوْ أَنْظُرْ فِي الْمُصْحَفِ 
Is it better for me to read by my heart or to look at the Mus'haf, the Quran, and read it from the Quran? Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, Bal iqra'hu wanzur fil Mus'haf. Imam said, read it from the text, look at the text, this is better, fahuwa afdal. Ama alimta, didn't you know, anna nazara fil Mus'haf ibadah, didn't you know that just looking at the Quran is ibadah? So, you read by heart. So, alhamdulillah, all the words are there. But if you look also at the text, so it would be additional merit. So, it's, so something easy that is ibadah is just look at the Quran. Maybe also it includes when we put some Quranic texts in the frames and we hang it on the wall. So this is also looking at the Quran, of course, with respect. We shouldn't, you know, stretch our leg towards the Quran. We should be very respectful to the Quran. But looking at the Quran and reading the Quran is by itself an ibadah. The second thing, of course, after Iman. So first was Iman, then after Iman, the first was looking at the Quran, the second is reading the Quran, reciting the Quran. Reciting the Quran, even without understanding, is again a bad. Like looking even without reading, although if you read it's better. Reading without understanding also is good, of course if you understand it is much better. So if someone just recites the Qur'an and his tongue and ears are receiving the light of Qur'an, this is about Of course, much, much better if someone understands. And therefore, inshallah, I will mention that in our hadiths, you should not be just concerned about recitation. So you say, okay, I want to finish this surah very quickly. Because if recitation is important for you, then you want to recite as many verses as possible. But no, it's better to adjust your speed and pace in the way that you can also reflect and understand. But if for any reason someone cannot understand Arabic or for any reason you know, just read, there is reward for that. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, من قرأ القرآن في المصحف متع ببصره. The same thing that we had for looking at the Quran, we have for قراءة because قراءة also has looking at the Quran. Your eyesight would be protected, would be preserved. وخفف عن والديه وإن كان كافرين. If you recite the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reduce the punishment or, you know, if your parents, you know, have done something that they will be forgiven, They're, if they have to be punished, the punishment will be reduced. So more rahmah will go to the parents, even if they are not believers. So if there is a believing person who recites the Qur'an, it is good for the parents, even if they are kafir. Now imagine if they are Muslim and they have themselves, you know, helped you to read the Qur'an. So if you want to do something for your parents, one of the best things is to read the Qur'an. In another hadith, Imam said, قِرَاءَةُ الْقُرْآنِ فِي الْمُصْحَفِ تُخَفِّفُ الْعَذَابِ عَنِ الْوَالِدَيْنِ وَلَوْ كَانَ كَافِرَيْنِ Very similar. It will reduce the punishment, even if they are not believers. Something that we have to observe is to try to learn how to read properly. Because anyway, the Quran is in Arabic language. You don't need to know Arabic, but you at least should try to read it right and properly. Not to misread, not to you know mispronounce, because then it would be far from the real text. 
For example, there is hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It says, "A'rabu al-Qur'an wal tamsu gharaibah." A'rabu al-Qur'an means, according to what has been translated, which makes sense, because Arab means to make it clear. A'rabu al-Qur'an means read it in a clear way. Sometimes people read the Quran in the way that you cannot distinguish between the letters. They just, you know, rush in reading and mix everything, you know, and mess <laughs> everything. It must be read in the way that people can realize if someone else is listening to you, says, okay, this is Zaleka, this is Al-Kitab. So it's clear. A person asked Imam Sadiq about this ayah. Quran says, Rattel al Qurana Tartila. What does Tartil mean? Tartil means to read in the way that you observe the waqf, observe, for example, you know, at least minimum, you know, clarity, so that you don't rush. So Imam Sadiq said, I, in this is my, you know, way of explaining. Let me tell you one hadith from Amir al muminin Amir al muminin said, Rattal al-Qur'ana tartila, this is a kind of tafsir, means, Bayyanuhu tabiyana, make the Qur'an in a clear way, read it in a clear way. La tahuddahu hadha shi'r, don't rush as a person who is reading a poem. Sometimes people who read poem, they read it very quickly, don't read the Quran like a poem too fast. Wala tansur hodathra raml and do not scatter it like a person who scatters stones or sands. Means too slow. For example, say Ehdena. Then after some seconds, Asrat. Then Al Mustaqim. No. It must not be too slow, because then the connection will be missed. And not too fast. You have to have a moderate speed. وَلَكَنْ أَفْزِعُوا قُلُوبَكُمُ الْقَاسِيَةِ What you have to do is that you have to soften your hard heart. Your heart becomes hard. You have to read the Qur'an in the way that makes your heart very soft. وَلَا يَكُنْ حَمُّ أَحَدُكُمْ آخِرَ السُّورَةِ You must not be concerned with reaching the end of surah. Sometimes when we read Qur'an or uh, some du'as, we just, you know, say how many pages are left. We go and check and come back. Why? There is no need to finish. If you are really in hurry, just read as much as you can, but let the Qur'an soften your heart. Indeed, it is not good. If, for example, I am speaking to you and all the time you look at the door or you look at the, your watch, I feel bad. Yeah? So, when I am reading the Qur'an and all the time I am looking at the chapter, the Qur'an feels bad. <laughs> this person, you know, doesn't like me. I haven't forced you to read me, but if you are reading me, show respect. So, Imam Ali Salam said, you should not be concerned about the end of surah. You must be concerned whether you are benefiting, whether you are understanding, whether you are getting the guidance, the light, or not. Okay, we stop here. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Oh.